Welcome to the Krishna Das Pilgrim Heart Hour. In this podcast, Krishna Das shares his warm-hearted and down-to-earth path to the divine. If you are interested in supporting Krishna Das's podcast, please go to beherenownetwork.com slash kd. Well, um, how did you find out the harmonium is the right instrument for your message or whatever you mm -hmm. gonna spread in the world or whatever or to reach your own heart? Mm -hmm. Is there a story behind when you first listened to the harmonium? You know, I used to play what they call an ektar, which is just a one string instrument that goes It's more of a rhythm instrument, but it's a note and it goes brum, 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 brum. But it was okay when there was 10 people. But once more people started to come, I, I never thought about microphones in those days. So I needed a louder instrument. So I got the harmonium and started to play. You see? You think I have a plan. <laughs> you think there's some reason I do this. Nothing! I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> But it works out okay. Well, uh, another question is that sometimes that you feel you playing the harmonium or is it the other way around that the harmonium plays you? Or <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's... Uh... Well, you could say, am I singing or is the singing singing me? You know, same question. And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> um, really, you know, it's kind of happening on automatic. I'm really not thinking about what I'm doing. So, but I wouldn't necessarily say the harmonium's playing me. You know? It's just a piece of wood. And, you know, It's not Indian music either, you know. If you, if you, people say, oh, I want to take harmonium lessons. I say, no, no, take piano lessons. If you, take, if you go to an Indian person to, to, to take a harmonium lesson, they're going to teach you Indian raga. And, you know, that's a lifetime study, at least. So this is just rock and roll, essentially. That's what I do. Thank you. So I have a question. Um, it, mm, microphones are tough for me. Um, I have a question that points back to what you were speaking about earlier and these moments in life of great despair. A moment? Of great despair, of yeah. grief, of despair, of questioning, of all the rest. Yeah. yeah. And you pointed to the fuck it moment when you said, fuck it, I'm going to sing. Mm -hmm. Do you have a... It actually wasn't fuck this. That was, that was a Fuck slide. it, no? It was like... Because I knew I had to sing. Right, right, right. Okay, so this is where my question is pointing yeah. to, is that, that thin line between surrender and collapse... Surrender and... Collapse or running away from something. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you can shed any light on the internal compass that points us either towards the surrender mm -hmm. or towards the sort of fuck it that says, I don't want it anymore, I want to check out. Mm -hmm. And if there's anything that you've gained in your experience of having those great moments of despair about how to make that discernment for yourself. Make? That discernment for yourself. There was no discernment. Okay. Once again, you give me too much credit. <laughs> Fair enough. It was simply that I knew I had to sing if I was going to live. And if he wasn't going to change my heart, I had to give up my pride about, I'm not going to do this until it feels the way I want it to feel. That's just pride. But I guess it worked after all, huh? <laughs> But I, I, I had to, I had, I, I couldn't, I, I hmm. you know, I, I had to sing. I wasn't letting myself sing. Ultimately, I had to stop honoring that and honor what I knew I had to do. 
I had to go for what I knew I had to do, even if I wasn't getting it the way I wanted it, even if I thought it was going to be hell on wheels to live, to get through it, I was going to have to do it. I didn't have, it seems like I had a choice, but really it was live or die, so it's not a lot of a choice, you know, when it comes down to it. Thanks. And let's put, it was going to either be happy or suffer the rest of my life. And I thought, well, I've done enough of that. Let's try something else. So. You said before many names pointing to the one. All one, not even pointing. It's just one. One, yeah. okay. Before you just, we were singing Amazing Grace. Do you have any, would you care to say something to how you relate to people who come from other traditions, who have not been to India, who are not into Indian yeah. religion, mm -hmm. who maybe come from other traditions, other lineages? Um, even though it's all one, I'm not going to try to make you believe that. <laughs> nor you, nor anybody else, right? I mean, you and anybody else is free to be who you are, worship or not worship, live the way you want. I have nothing to say about that. I'm not trying to change anybody or make anybody follow this way. Uh, you know, um, this is what I do that gives me sustenance and strength and, you know, all the things, those inner qualities, this is what I do. So I'm, I share that with anybody. If they don't want a piece of it, that's okay. But from my point of view, I can include all those things from my point of view because, you know, if they don't include me, well, that's okay. I have nothing I can do about that. And I wouldn't, you know, I mean, I had a big, I, I, didn't, I didn't like Jesus. He screwed everybody. It was horrible. Look at all the people who died, the Crusades. And tonight, people are still killing people. These Christians don't like those Christians. Those Christians don't like those people. You know, organized religion is a disaster as far as I'm concerned. Disorganized religion, that's what I like. That's why I'm in India, you know. But so, but it wasn't, wasn't until Maharaji started to talk to us about Jesus. In a way, like, you can't imagine. It was like the most intensely sweet, direct feeling. It was so extraordinary, you know. There was so much feeling on his part, which was unusual. You never saw him. He was always joking around and laughing. But this, he went boom, you know. So then we began to read the Bible at the, up in the mountains, in the Himalayas. And we thought, you know what? This is what we're doing here. It's the same thing. It was quite a... So I just, my own heart had to soften about all that stuff, you know. And I think a lot of Westerners... I think we've been, our hearts have been very hurt by, um, by what people call God, what religions call God. I think there's almost no way to go into that with an open heart. It's like you have to kind of shut down and start hating people to join one religion or another. Not everybody's like that, but growing up that's what it seemed like to me. So there's hurt there, you know, and so I felt really relieved to feel that Jesus was a saint like these saints I was meeting in India. You know, these great saints, obviously, not just a little saint, but a really big saint. Maharaji feeding people with the bread, raising, healing the sick, raising the dead. You saw every day you tripped over that in India. Not exactly, but... It's well known. Those things happen all the time. In the West, 
you don't hear about that every day. But in India, there's a million stories of saints who have done those things. Well, not a million, 900,000. So to, to then include that that way, that's the way it got kind of backed up into that. You know, so. And if you read Rumi and Hafiz, how can you, you know, wah, it's amazing. You know, you can't, it doesn't get better than that. So, but once again, how do I deal with people? <laughs> you know, one time we were in the, in the mountains out west in a state called Utah. And um, there's, a, there's a sacred place to the Native Americans there. And we, used, we went there every year in the summer. And we would sing. And uh, it was a few of us at this yoga retreat. But the words started to get out to the local people. So one year we arrived there, and there was like campers and RVs and everything, right? And there was this truck parked in the field where we were behind us. And the guy had like rifles in his truck, you know, guns. And we sat down, and I said to my friend, I said, you know, maybe we should just skip it this year. <laughs> you know, what do you think? Can you not sing? Oh, no, man, we got to sing here. <laughs> So we finished singing, and I hear the truck door open and close. It's behind me, right? And I feel this guy's walking in our direction. And I'm going, <laughs> <laughs> so he comes, we're sitting on the ground. This, this big guy with boots and a cowboy hat, he's standing in front of me. I'm looking up at him like this. And he looks at me and he says, are you Krishna Das? Yeah. <laughs> he said, boy, I love your music. <laughs> I hear it on, on public radio out there on the prairie when I'm with the cattle. <laughs> yeah, you know? So, what can I tell you, you know? I just keep singing, what the hell? Best way to live, best way to die. <laughs> another time, another time, a friend of mine, when I first started traveling and singing, another time, I was in LA, and this friend of mine said, Oh, there's this great place to sing in Tucson, Arizona. So she set up an evening for me there, and I drove out there with my friend, and it turned out it was this Middle Eastern restaurant. And the entrance to the restaurant was here. The kitchen was here, and the dining room was there. And there was a room here at the entrance which had about three rows of maybe five chairs each. And I was supposed to sit on the floor opposite the chairs, and the waitresses and waiters are going by <laughs> in front of us on the way to the dining room. They're washing pots and pans and making cappuccinos in the, in the kitchen. And everybody's like walking in and walking in front of us onto the way to the dining room. And I'm going, Hare Krishna. So there was maybe four people there that night, you know. So I f we finished singing. We're just about to start Namashivaya. And two huge Native American guys who are obviously drunk out of their minds, stumble into the room. And they sit on, in the front row of chairs, right in front of me, kind of like. And I said, oh my Lord, I am going to sing my ass off because this is going to be the last Namashiraya. I mean, there was no way we could pick the gear up and run away fast enough, so we, we might as well stay there. So I started to sing. We finished Namashivaya with a long om. And I'm sitting with my eye closed, and I re realized that one of these guys has gotten up and is now standing right in front of me. But like... 
kind of leaning over. And he's, he must have been 20 feet tall, you know? He's huge. And I'm looking up at this guy, and I'm thinking, this is it. We're out of here. And he looks at me and says, I'm Native American. Okay, I see that. He said, I was in Vietnam. Okay, good. You must still have a knife or two around, huh? Good. He said, I know the real thing when I hear it. Right, off with the head. He said, you got it. I couldn't believe my ears. And then they stumbled out of there. You know? It's just amazing to me. So at my so I've been trained now through my own experience that when the shit hits the fan, you sing. <laughs> and you keep singing until the fan breaks. You know, you just keep singing. That's the best thing you could possibly do. Don't listen to your mind. That's gonna screw you up every time. So it was amazing, you know. So uh, that's what. Uh, so that's you know that's some of the things. Um, I really love kirtan, and I when I started doing it, I found it a very yeah you know all the things we say freeing and purifying practice, mm -hmm. and um, then I started leading a bit of kirtan, and Sorry I find to hear that. Yeah. yeah yeah, and I find sometimes you know. Uh, the ego problems, you know, that come up with that really can, yeah. um, you take away from the joy. Yeah. And I was wondering if you ever experienced this problem and, and what... Never. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I'm very happy to hear that you are aware of that. that uh, because that's a very a great blessing to be able to see yourself and see your stuff. Um, you obviously didn't read my book. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I will. <laughs> no ego, no ego there. Just telling you, I can tell you didn't read my book. So, um, but in the book, I, I talk about this because what happened to me was this. Uh, I had this experience where I understood that I had to sing with people in order to save my, my heart, my life, right? So I finally started singing with people. But after a while, after about four, five, six months, more people were starting to come. I mean, at first it was like six people, you know? Uh, but after a while, like you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 people, 60 people, the room started to fill up. People, there was a line around the, around the block waiting for people, to, you know, on Monday nights. It was all free on Monday nights at Jiva Mukti in New York. So I began to see that what was going to happen, what was happening. And uh, I saw very clearly that I was not capable of doing this in a good way because I had desires for fame, for I wanted to be loved, for power. There were all these things in me and I saw there was no way that I was going to definitely use this whole situation to feed myself. It was, I had, there was no, I had no choice, I had to. I could see that I was incapable of not doing that. And it really freaked me out because here was the one thing that I could do to save my heart and I was going to screw it up. I was not able to do it in the right way. It was, I was offering this to my guru, I was singing to my guru, and yet I was going to grab everybody that came to me to see what they could do for me, right? I really, I really flipped out. I felt a really terrible despair. 
And um, I literally quit singing. I quit, and I went to India. And I was talking to Maharaji, you know. Okay, so he's dead, so what? I can't talk to him? So I was talking to him, and I said, you have to fix this. This is your problem. I'm singing to people in your name. You have to fix this. I can't do anything. You have to fix this. Nothing happened. <laughs> Nothing. Anyway, so almost three months went by. And uh, I was getting ready to leave India. And nothing had changed in my heart. I knew that. And I was staying in the temple up in the mountains. And at night, I'd go to this place where it was all dark and I could see the stars. It was beautiful, you know. And I would talk to him and I'd say, What are you doing? You haven't done it yet. What's wrong? Get it together. You know, this is your business here. Take care of it. And then I go to sleep. The next day, same, nothing happened. So one day, it's the two days before I was going to leave, right? I'm talking to him and I said, I don't understand. Why haven't you fixed this? You could do it if you want to. See, I had no doubt that he could do it. But he wasn't doing it. So I said, all right, what can I do? If you're not going to do it, you're not going to do it. I'll go back, I'll sing, how bad could it be? That was the moment that changed everything. That's what you call, I mean, I didn't know it at the time, but looking back, that was the moment of surrender, of accepting things the way they are, and saying, fuck it, I'll deal with it. That changed everything. And then the next day, a whole thing started, which completely changed my life. But that was the moment. So it's not like you have to be anybody else in order to continue singing. You have to be yourself. And that means looking at all this stuff. The practice is very simple. Sing. And then when you feel like, wow, how great this is, let it go. Come back. Humility is, is and, and paying attention to your stuff is the greatest gift that you can give yourself. So, it's up to you. You have to decide whether you think, because it's a hot fire. You're putting yourself in the fire. Because you're presenting yourself to people, and then people are going to start projecting onto you. And you're going to enjoy that. We all want to be loved. Nothing wrong with it. But, is that why we're doing this? So, whatever. But, keep singing. It doesn't have to be with people. Birds sing. If, if it's to be that people are going to come and sing with you, it is. If they're not, they're not. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't, this is not, this is, this is not entertainment. This is a practice. You have to share your practice, which means you have to do your practice. So, if you're doing your practice and it turns out that people want to share that with you and do the practice with you, then they'll be there. If not, it ain't going to happen. It's not a career. You know, my high school guidance counselor did not have Kirtanwala in her book as careers. You know. You know. This is what you have to be doing to save your life. And, you know, it could take any form. I don't know if you can imagine the despair that I felt. Here was the one thing that I could do that's going to save my ass. And I was being prevented from doing it by my own stuff. Right? Nobody could fix that from the outside. Nobody could say, oh, it's okay, you sing. No, it's not okay. That had to come from inside, and only Maharaji could 
fix that for me, could change that. I knew that. And he did. Or I wouldn't be here. He did. He changed it. I had to be forced to chant. Really. Um, we didn't want to, uh, you know, in the temple with Maharaji, there was a room around the side where the kirtan wallas sang all day long, Hare Krishna all day long, from early morning to late at night. And we used to sing with them when Maharaji was inside. But as soon as he came out, we would run to be with him, because that's what we wanted to do. So one day towards the end of the rainy season, when the temple closes in the winter, um, one of these Indian kirtanwalas uh, kind of came on to one of the Western women, tried to seduce one of the Western women there. So, of course, Maharaji found out about it, and in about 10 minutes, all 20 of these guys were loaded onto a truck with all their stuff driven down to the train, sent back home to Brindavan. So, one of the people in the temple said, Baba, you just kicked out the kirtan walls. Who's going to sing now? The Westerners. Oh. This was not good news. Because we had to sit in this little room, right, around the side, and we couldn't see him when he came out. And we, we used to do it in shifts, a couple of hours at a time, three hours, four hours. And um, if he came out, you know, he didn't spend that much time with us, maybe an hour, 20 minutes, sometimes a day. So if he came out while you were singing, you didn't get to see him. It was terrible. We had one instruction, sing. And no instruction about stopping. <laughs> you know, so it's scary. How long is this going to go on? So, you know, I'd be singing, I'd be sitting there, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. And, you know, I figured this is a good time to relive my life, to think about everything that happened to me in my whole life. So, Hare Krishna, because I certainly didn't want to pay attention. You know, I tried to pay attention a little bit, but, you know, uh, okay. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Yeah, I remember when I was three years old. Uh, and the, the singing's going on, but I'm thinking about other things, you know. I'm thinking about, you know, stuff that happened when I was growing up. And then, you know, I remembered my old girlfriend, you know, back in America. Hare <laughs> Krishna. <laughs> and then I remembered she broke up with me. Hare <laughs> It was torture, really. But, but after a while, something actually began to happen. And nobody was more surprised than me. Because I wasn't expecting anything to happen. He said, sing, we sing. That's it. I wasn't doing it for any reason, you know. But what happened was, the mantra just got more comfortable, right? And it's, it just kind of flew, flowed more easily. And thoughts would come, and they just kind of pass through. They wouldn't hang around very long. And it, the, the mantra, the chanting, got to be, it felt like home. And then the thoughts would come through, boom. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. It was amazing. It was the first time in my life that I'd been freed even the slightest bit from thinking, from the stuff in the mind going all the time. It was amazing. So, without that experience, I don't know that uh, I would have started chanting later. But because of because he forced, and it was even worse. You see, there was this big microphone hanging from the ceiling that was left over from World War One, 
and it was blasting this, our miserable chanting to the whole valley. And, and all these women picking potatoes in the field going like, what is that, man? Yeah. <laughs> what can I tell you? So, we must, if you want to find out what's going on, you have to do a practice. You have to devote some time to it, which is hard to do in our lives because it's so busy. Everything's so fast and so full of stuff. So it's good to take time away to do some practice on a weekend or a week or, you know, it's a good thing to do for, for ourselves. We need that time. Otherwise, psh, boom, next life. What happened? I was just watching TV. I don't know what happened.